Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. If you can, you can look up the hymn. I'm going to start this with the hymn. And the hymn kind of lines up with the study that we're going to be talking about today. But the hymn I'm going to be singing today is, Is Your All on the Altar? Is Your All on the Altar of Sacrifice Laid? You have longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase. And have earnestly, fervently prayed. But you cannot have rest, or be perfectly blessed, Until all on the altar is laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the Spirit control? You can only be blessed, and have peace and sweet rest, as you yield him your body and soul. Would you walk with the Lord in the light of his word, and have peace and contentment always? You must do his sweet will to be free from all ill, on the altar your all must be laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the Spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield Him your body and soul. Oh, we never can know what the Lord will bestow of the blessings for which we have prayed. Till our body and soul He doth fully control, and our all on the altar is laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the Spirit control? You can only be blessed, and have peace and sweet rest, as you yield Him your body and soul. Who can tell all the love He will send from above, and how happy our hearts will be made. On the fellowship sweet we shall share at His feet, when our all on the altar is laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the Spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield Him your body and soul. It's a good old hymn talking about is your all on the altar of sacrifice late. Paul talks about it and we'll quote this verse in the study and how you're supposed to be a living, living sacrifice. Holy and accept without blemish and holy and acceptable to the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Okay? You're supposed to be a living sacrifice. Now, the title of this study was going to be is, is Why is the love of the brethren wax cold? Why is the love of the brethren? Love the brethren, wax cold. And before we get into it, turn with me to 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3. We're going to read 1 through 9 real quick. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, 
but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Okay. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janes and Jambres, which stood, withstood Moses, those are the two priests in the Old Testament, uh, when you had Moses performing miracles, you had these priests of Pharaoh performing the same miracles up to a point. They withstood Moses up to a point. These is talking about in these last days, you're going to have a lot of people having a professing of godliness. We're going to have a lot of false converts in these last days. But when's the one true test of who's truly saved and who's born again? We've talked about this before. Let's keep reading. Now, as Jane, James and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, Jesus Christ, the true plan of salvation, God's perfect written word. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Now, these last days, I believe it's talking about, there's last days where it's talking about the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. There's last days where it's talking, where, before Jesus calls us home. He appears in the clouds and calls us home. And then there's last days talking about the end of the time of Jacob's trouble when Jesus comes back. Okay? This is talking about the time of the Gentiles. Before we get caught up, the very last days, Paul's saying, in the last days, it's going to get bad. And it says here, verse 9, but they shall proceed no Further, what does that mean? They won't get caught up. It's going to be manifest who's truly saved and who's born again. And in these last days, you go through there and you look at all this has to do with sin and wickedness, lust of the flesh. And they don't want the truth. Now, you say, well, what does that have to do with the brethren? Why is the brethren wax cold? Okay, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter two verse three it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man sin revealed the son of perdition. Okay. In the last days, it's going to get very wicked, and it has. We look out there today, there's sin everywhere, it's at your fingertips. It's everywhere. There's so much temptation, lust of the flesh. One of the biggest things that's being taught today is the, the self-love and that me, myself, and I come first. You always put me, myself, and I first and self-love. And what they're really saying, that self-love is really saying that, you can, that you're to be fleshly and worldly and you put yourself first. Okay. But you see that Paul talks about there's a falling away. Okay. Why is the love of the brethren waxing cold? This falling away, what's a big part of it the Lord's put on my heart to preach and teach today? Okay. A few months ago, because this is a study I've been working on for several months, a few months ago I was going through Matthew 24 in my morning read, and if you turn to Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, it says this, What gets in the way of us loving, our, loving the Lord? What gets in the way of us loving our brothers and sisters in Christ? What gets in the way of us loving the lost world by preaching the... I'm getting ahead of myself, but by preaching the truth to them? Okay. Matthew 24, 12 says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Okay, We're going to come back to that. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Now, I understand that Matthew 24 is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. Mark 13, you don't have to turn here, but Mark 13, 12 says, Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, and the children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I'm present tense saved right now. I don't have to endure to the end of anything to be saved. By the time of Jacob's trouble, you have to endure to the end, and then you get saved. But you look at what's going on here. The brother shall betray brother to death, the father the son, the children shall rise. Doesn't that sound like the love of many shall wax cold? 
Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, that Jesus speaking, Think not that I have come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. By, for I have come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against a mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. In the time of Jacob's trouble, you take the mark, you worship the beast. And if you refuse to take the mark and worship the beast, whoever does, you're the automatically the enemy of whoever does. Let's say you have a wife. If you, you're not saved, you go into the time of Jacob's trouble, you get left behind. We just read there where it be made manifest. They get left behind. They're not saved. And it says made man. I forgot to point out this point. It says it's manifest to all men. So when we go to heaven, we're going to be up there looking, going, not everybody's here that I thought was going to be here. There's going to be people left down here on earth that the rest of the world's going to see them and go, wait a minute, I thought you said you were going to get caught up. I thought you said you were a Christian. It's going to be manifest to all men who was truly saved and who wasn't. In the time of Jacob's trouble, you, if you have a husband that takes the mark and worships the beast, and you refuse to take the mark and worship the beast, you now become an enemy. Okay? Same thing with a wife, same thing with children, same thing with friends. Basically, the love of many is going to wax cold because iniquity shall abound. And today, iniquity, believe it or not, when you look into things, brothers and Christ, iniquity is tied into money. If you don't have money, you really can't indulge in that much iniquity, like sin. Please understand what I'm saying. I'm talking about, like, everything is money-based. Internet. You pay for the internet. You pay for alcohol, you pay for drugs, you pay for your food, you pay for your... Everything has to do with money. A lot of the fun that people like, I mean, today it used to be you, the children, I'll say it like this, the children used to go outside to play. Go outside and play. Now you see children sitting there on their tablets that cost money. On their cell phones that cost money. Or they're sitting there playing their video games that cost money. You won't have your you won't be able to indulge the flesh as much as they do today if you don't take in that time period, because today it's all about money. You have money, you pay for it, you pay for it. Indulge the flesh all you want. But in that time period, you have to take the mark and worship the beast to get your fix. To get your flesh fix. To fulfill the lust of your flesh. That and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Now, I wanted to make the point that I believe doctrinally this is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble, when Jesus was physically there preaching the kingdom of heaven and the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. But I came across that verse and it said, and, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And I got stuck on the love of many shall wax cold, and it's because iniquity. People are choosing sin over love. They're, cho they're choosing lust of the flesh and worldliness over love. Hmm. Does that apply to day, like for instruction in righteousness? And that kind of reminded me that, hey, didn't Paul say something like this? Turn to 2 Corinthians. Remember, you can pause the video and turn. We're not going to turn everywhere physically. I have it here, but there's times we're going to be turning here, and there's times I'm going to be quoting it here. Just, just a reminder. we got a lot to go through. I'm going to try to make this a two-hour video, minimum, or max. It says, okay, 2 Corinthians 12, 15. This is Paul. Paul says, I will gla very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, there's the love, the less I be loved. What's going on here? Paul's preaching the truth to them. He's kicking their worldliness. He's kicking their sin. He's kicking their fault the wrong way and teaching them the right way. And the more I love you, remember it's done out of love, not hate, not bitterness, not envy. We're going to go through some of those. Uh, no, it's done out of love. In Galatians 4.16, Paul says, in Galatians 4.16, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? 
In Galatians, you had he taught them the true plan of salvation. He held nothing back. Repentance towards God. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And after salvation, we do good works to please God because we belong to Him. We're bought with the price. We're not our own. We have that judgment seat of Christ we're looking forward to. But we do good works because we're a new creature in Christ Jesus and we serve, we love Lord. We love our God. We love our Lord Jesus Christ. And true love for Him is doing what He commands us to do. But someone come on, came along and said, no, you still have to do works to merit salvation, to make you worthy of salvation, to earn salvation. And Paul starts getting them back on the right path, and they start treating them like an enemy. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The world's way, the flesh's way, Satan's way, remember the three enemies, the flesh, the world, Satan. Okay. Excuse me. Okay. The love for anyone, true love for anyone is telling them the truth, warning them of the danger of the path that they are on. I remember a preacher once preached and he told a story about, you know, salvation because people were saying we don't we shouldn't mention sin much. We can generalize sin, but we shouldn't mention specific sins. And calling out people's specific sins and warning them that the cost of that sin that they're doing, that individual's doing, the cost of that sin is hell. We shouldn't be talking about hell when we preach the gospel. And, and we shouldn't be talking about sin. We shouldn't be talking about that our God is a consuming fire and the wrath of the Lord is on the ch children of disobedience and everything. And it's saying we should just stick with the positive stuff. And I remember this preacher, he was telling a story. And he said, okay, let's say you have a lost family, a couple, married couple, and they're lost. And their car got totaled, and you invite them over, and you give them a brand new car. You fill the car with clothes, you fill the car with food, and you give them $10,000. And you send them down the road saying, that way will get you back home. That, you go down that road, and that road will get you back home. But in the back of your head, there's a blind turn, and the bridge is out, and, they're, and you're sending them off late at night. It's a blind turn. It's like a quick turn bridge. It's out. You're going to fall down in the ditch. You can't see it. You can't react fast enough. You don't tell them about the bridge, you, that the bridge is out. Now, did you love them? You gave them a brand new car. You gave them food galore. You gave them clothes galore. You gave them $10,000. But you didn't tell them about that they're heading for destruction. If you don't warn people about hell, then you don't love them. And it's talking about preaching the truth to them, loves them. And you say, well, what does that have to do with the brethren? When you see a brethren that's lost his way, that gets back in the, the flesh, sins of the flesh, gets back into worldliness, that's mistreat handling the word of God, that's mistreating the brethren. When you see a brethren that's going down, heading for destruction, remember what the Bible says, if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. That's for both saved and lost. When you start letting things get in the way of your walk with the Lord, and you start doing wrong by the Lord, mishandling his word, you see that they're heading for destruction. Not hell, but they're, they're heading for destruction as far as destroying their walk with the Lord. Destroying their usefulness in the ministry. Destroying their fellowship with the brethren with each other. Their fellowship with the brethren. Destroying their testimony with the lost world. What do we do? We need to come to them and we need to warn them. And that's what Paul's doing. He's coming to them and warning them and correcting them. Rebuking some people, correcting some people, and preaching the truth to them. And when he does that, what happens? They seem to love him less. Not more. Some people will love you more when you preach the truth, but as a whole, it's talking about the more I love, the less I am loved. The more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. Galatians 4, 6. And therefore, therefore, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. Because I tell you the truth. And I'm looking at that, and it's like, iniquity seems, I started looking back at my own past saying, okay, What's caused me to lose fellowship with brethren, brethren to turn on me like ravening wolves, like dogs? 
that, you know, the whole saying was rabies. When a dog gets rabies, even if they, you're, you, that dog is your best friend and everything, they turn on you <laughs> like you're an enemy. They don't know who you are and they just go crazy trying to destroy you. They just become an enemy. I've had brethren in the past do that, or professing brethren in the past do that. I believe some are saves. I believe some are false converts. We'll get into that a little bit more. But I'm sitting here and I'm talking with the Lord and I'm like, I remember a guy once that he was on my channel and he's basically patting me on the back. Oh, great preaching. Preach it, brother. You, this is amazing teaching. God's really using you. You're great. You're amazing. You're so great. He's patting me on the back. That's why I always push, brother, sister Christ. I don't want to get prideful. I don't want to get puffed up. That's why... I keep pushing the brethren to give God all the glory. Okay, you can say, I thank, you. I thank the Lord for, for showing you this, brother, and for, sh for you sharing it with me. You know, something along those lines. But you have those people that get on there and they, Amen, preacher, preach it, preach it. Amen, brother. And they're just, they puff you up and they really, like, they're glorifying you. But I had a guy that was doing that for a good several months. And then I came across his Facebook page. And I looked on his Facebook page. And it seemed like the, the, the professing brother, he was into Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games. He was really into Star Wars. He was really into the superhero, the DC comics, the Marvels. He was, just, he was really into worldliness and sin and wickedness. And so I, pride, I always believe that when you see someone that's in sin, you need to go, A, you need to go to the person and talk to them. You don't talk about them behind their back. You don't make videos against them on the spot. You don't do any. You go to the person themselves. That's real love, like Paul did. Real love is going to that person that you see that's heading for destruction. They're doing wrong. They're doing something that's hindering their walk with the Lord. Something that they're going to have to answer for someday. If they don't get it worked out now, they're going to have to answer for it someday at the judgment seat of Christ. And you go to him with love, and I went to him and told him that that stuff was wickedness and that stuff was sin, and he was shocked that I found him. On, uh, I didn't find him. I wasn't searching for him. It was one of the suggestions on Facebook, where it comes by and suggests this friend, just this friend. And I was like, hey, I know that name. He's, that's the same name underneath my channel is making comments. So I start looking. So I did this under the Facebook, and I made the comments under Facebook, and I let him know that, hey, so that stuff you're doing is sin and wickedness. He stopped making comments. All of a sudden, he stopped making comments under my channel. Then, a few months down the road, he starts making videos against me. And I'm like, wait a second. I start doing this study, and I'm like, I understand what Paul's talking about here. All I did was show him that that was sin, that was wickedness, and now it's between him and the Lord. I showed him the truth. Okay. We're not in fellowship so it's not like I have to break fellowship with him. It's just I showed him the truth. And he went from patting me on the back all the time, oh, you're doing pre great preaching, praise the Lord, to now he says all kinds of mean and evil things about me. What happened? Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They really can turn on you. And Paul, they were turning on Paul. The less I love, the, the more I love, the less I am loved. I had my own mentor when I disagreed with him on some things, and I showed him the scriptures, and I said, listen, I, I did Bible studies first, and I said, listen, let's get together, let's do a Bible study, and let me show you what the Lord has shown me, and let's find out if I line up with the Bible, or if I need to change and conform to the Word of God. Let's find out where the Bible's right, and Philip Newton's wrong, and I tried to offer to do a Bible study with him, he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. And then when I made videos disagreeing with them on certain topics of the Bible, especially when it comes to sin and lust of the flesh and worldliness and the world's way of doing things, all of a sudden he went from being a mentor that said, I love you, brother, I'm here for you, brother, I'm praying for you, brother, and supporting me in ministry and helping me in ministry, he went to trying to crucify me at every turn. What happened? The love of the brethren shall wax cold. I mean, the love of many shall wax cold. Why? Have I become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. The more I love you, the less I am loved. True love is telling the truth. I'll tell you this, brother, sister Christ, when I wasn't getting into ministry, getting behind the camera, and I was just making comments in the comment section, 
I probably had brethren that said, well, I don't quite agree with that man. I really don't. But I'm still going to love him. You know, I'm still going to talk with him and fellowship with him and everything. And then when I got into ministry, when I started putting myself behind the camera, when I started using the scriptures to do Bible studies, to stand for the truth, more than half those people that used to be friendly and patting me on the back, half of them turned on me. What happened? I started standing for the truth and preaching the truth. When it was just my words, it's just his feelings and opinions. We can all get along, like he said. We can all hold hands and sing kumbaya. Ah, there's just things we can agree to disagree on. As long as you don't do a solid Bible study on it, and we can all just sit around and agree to disagree, then we can all hold hands and sing kumbaya. But the moment you start hitting them with hard facts, the truth, the Word of God, doing solid studies, kicking their lowercase g gods, kicking their false beliefs, kicking their flesh, kicking their sin, they change. All of a sudden, now they went from being friendly to being adversarial. They start acting like enemies. Now, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We love talking about instruction in righteousness. We love teaching doctrine. But we also forget that there's reproof and there's correction. We're to correct according to this book, and we're supposed to reprove according to this book. And we're going to get into this a little bit more. We're supposed to do it a certain way. Right. 2 Timothy 4.1 says, 2 Timothy 4.1, why is it important when Paul says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The scriptures get this, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. Why is it important that the man of God be made perfect? It's talking about having a perfect heart, not sinlessly perfect, but having a perfect heart. You're trying your best to hide God's word in your heart. Remember the Bible says, If I hide thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. This is how we teach people. This is how we correct brethren. We, we exhort them through the scriptures to stay on the right path, and we correct them through the scriptures when they lose that path, when they fall to the right or fall to the left, or they start to backpedal and try to resurrect the old man. It's through the scriptures we do it. But why is it that important that the man of God be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works? 2 Timothy 4.1 says, I charge thee before, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. At his appearing, the judgment seat of Christ. The body of Christ gets caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble, and we go through the judgment seat of Christ. We want to see people get rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. We want to see people, brethren, do well, but the first person you focus on is, is this person. Lord, I'm, I, am I going to do good at the judgment seat of Christ? Then you try to help the brethren around you. We're all going to have to answer to Jesus Christ someday. I know the big push today is, oh, you get saved, you're free from all judgment. That's a lie. That's a total lie. My judgment at the judgment seat of Christ is not based off of where I spend eternity. It's going to be based off how I get to spend eternity. That's what my rewards are, how I get to go into eternity with, what, with my rewards. So the judgment, uh, here it says, at his appearing and at his kingdom. The great white throne judgment at the end where everyone that hasn't been judged at the judgment seat of Christ, that's not part of the body of Christ, everyone else gets judged at the judgment seat of Christ and it's predominantly lost people because the Bible in Revelation says death and hell were brought up and whoever was not written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. They're brought up for judgment. Okay. Why? Do we correct and rebuke the lost world, point out their sin and wickedness, warn them about hell and God's wrath and God's judgment? Because there's a coming judgment. We don't want to see them go to hell. We don't want to see them go to get tossed in the lake of fire. For the brethren, we don't want to see them lose rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. That's why we reprove and correct. Everyone's going to get judged someday by the Lord. By God Almighty. 
through his son, his body, his flesh, his son, Jesus Christ. Everyone has to stand before him and answer it. The Bible says, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, so that every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Everyone has to give an account of himself to God, saved and lost. We're just not, the saved are just not getting judged off of eternity, where we get to spend eternity. Once again, we're getting judged off how we get to spend eternity. What our rewards are going to be. And I've already quoted some of this, but uh, 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word. That's why we preach the word. And we're supposed to be instant, out of season, or in season, and out of season. When it's popular, when it's not popular. When the body of Christ seems to be strong and doing right, when the body of Christ seems to be falling apart. Like these last days, the falling away. We're supposed to stay strong no matter what. We're supposed to preach the word. Mainly men in ministry, we're supposed to continue preaching the word. We're supposed to keep standing for what's right, encouraging the brethren to get back into a standing position. We try our best to plant seeds and encourage the lost world to get saved. Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. There it is. Reprove, rebuke. And like I said, we exhort through the scriptures how to. To encourage brethren to remain standing, to stay on the right path, to do what is right by the Lord. Verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. What's that time? The last days. Now there's people that didn't endure sound doctrine in Paul's day. We just read it there in Galatians. They started turning over to a false gospel real quick. But it talks about for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts. Keep to themselves teachers having itching ears, and shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. What gets in the way of them remaining firm and standing for what is right and doing what is right? After their own lusts. What do we read up there? And because iniquity, for instruction in righteousness, in Matthew 24, 12, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. When your flesh takes over and iniquity takes over, it becomes a me, myself, and I, and a survival of the flesh. And if anybody gets in the way of that flesh, you don't, see, you don't love them. You start getting bitter towards them. You start getting hateful towards them. You start getting angry at them. You start showing hate instead of love. Right. What causes, brethren... To butt heads. Okay? The falling away today, what I'm seeing down here in the body of Christ, there's a lot of division. There's a lot of heads butting. There's a lot of fighting, infighting, and arguing. And I believe the number one cause of these last days, if you actually trace everything back, it's lust. It's fleshliness. It's worldliness. Pride is a sin. It always comes back down to sin. The sins of the flesh. Pride is a sin. One of the big things that causes brethren to butt heads immediately is pride. Okay. You come at somebody with pride and arrogancy, and, being, and you come across as a jerk, you're going to have a hard time winning someone to the truth that way. And it's a sin that's getting in the way. Their own lusts. Acts chapter 20 verse 29 says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. False converts. We're going to be talking about this a little bit more later. False converts coming in and bringing in lust and sin and worldliness to destroy the flock. Verse 30. Here's for this. Also of your own selves. You mean the falling away? You mean brethren that are saved? Your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things. And I believe those perverse things are based off the lusts of the flesh. They're getting into worldliness and lusts of the flesh. They're giving in to the three enemies, the flesh, the world, Satan. And they start speaking, you know, doctrines of devils. They start speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. They start causing division in the body of Christ. Well, I'm with so-and-so. 
He tells me what I want to hear. I'm sorry. He tells my flesh what it wants to hear. I mean, He tells me what I want to hear. And it starts causing division. Turn to Romans 13. Romans 13. Start causing division. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Paul says, the more I love, the less I am loved. Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I had, like I said, I had that one bro professing brother, when I called out his sin and wickedness, the next thing I know I went from being his best buddy to being a, a, like one of his worst enemies. I know other men on here that I've called out and I said, hey, that Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, anime, satanic style music, it's all wickedness, it's all sin. And I went from being, well, he's okay, to I'm a heretic. Brought over here, I disagree with him on Christmas and show how pagan Christmas is, how it doesn't line up with the Word of God. It's not a godly thing, it's a fleshly thing, a lust of the flesh thing. It's not about pleasing God, it's about pleasing man. And I talked to him about it, next thing I know, I'm a heretic. In his eyes, I'm the enemy. I'm a heretic. Romans, of your own self shall men arise speaking perverse things. Oh, there's nothing wrong with Hollywood movies and TV. Don't let anybody tell you there's something wrong with Hollywood movies, TV shows, and video games. Oh, there's nothing wrong with Christmas. Oh, there's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong... Speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Teachers with itching ears. You ever notice the people that surround them? This group over here that thinks Hollywood movies, TV shows, they're a group of people that love that, that sin and that wickedness. The other people over here, Christmas, they love that wickedness. Oh, it's okay to drink alcohol every once in a while. We'll try to hide the fact that we get drunk, like the group that tries to make drinking and drunkenness okay. We'll try to hide the fact that we get drunk and everything, but, you know, that teach with itching ears. They tell them what they want to hear. Romans 13, 8 through 13. Start 8. It says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. Also, of your own self, so men arise, speaking perverse things. It's about self-love. It's about my flesh wants this, and I'm going to give my flesh what it wants, lust of the flesh. It says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Notice it says you're supposed to love, and then it starts mentioning lust of the flesh. What gets in the way of your love? For the lost world, your love for the brethren, and more important, most importantly, your love for the Lord. Remember, Jesus said, if, you, if a man love me, he will keep my words. If you love me, keep my commandments. There's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Did you give your life to Jesus Christ? The next verse says, Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. What gets in the way of your love for Jesus Christ? You're our Lord and Savior. Sin, lust of the flesh. Verse 10. Love worketh no ill. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law, and that knowing the time that now is, is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. It goes back to why do we correct our brothers and sisters in Christ? We do it out of love because we know that someday we're all going to get caught up, we're all going to have to stand before Jesus Christ, and we're all going to have to answer for our life as a Christian. How we treated this book, how we treated each other, how we treated the lost world. We're all going to have to answer for it. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness. What gets, you, what keep, gets in the way of you putting on the whole armor of God? Lust of the flesh, worldliness, doctrines of devils, Satan, and his ministers. 
the wolves in sheep's clothing that Paul was warning them about. Wolves coming in. Lust of the flesh. and they all, the, Satan always entices you with the lust of the flesh. The world's way is always fleshly. And of course, we, if you're watching this and the saved brother and sister Christ, you understand our own struggles with our own flesh, trying to put it down. Paul says, make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. We're supposed to bring every thought into subjection to the obedience of Christ. We're always having to put this body of flesh down. What gets in the way of walking, let's walk honestly as in the day. When we start getting into writing and drunkenness, we start getting into the flesh and worldliness. Not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. But, once again, not in chambering, not in wantonness, not in strife, not in envy. These are all sins. These are all lusts of the flesh. This is the flesh's way of doing things. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. What's getting in the way? What's causing a lot of brethren to butt heads? The worldliness and fleshliness is coming in. And some of the brethren are starting to choose the world, the flesh, the world. They're starting to listen to servants of Satan. And we're all starting to butt heads. Those of us who are trying to stand for the Word of God versus those that are starting to fall away. And the ones we really butt heads with is the false converts trying to go against this book. Trying to make sin okay. Sin for a season. Whose God is their belly. Whose glory is in their shame. Who mind earthly things. 2 Timothy 2.24 says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive. Brothers and Christ, one of the biggest things we do, we think we're standing for the word of God when we are fighting people and arguing with people and, and getting into fights with people. Verbal fights. I pray it's never a physical fight. But verbal fights, we get into debating. The servant of the Lord must not strive. We're not supposed to be prideful. We're not supposed to seek the destruction of the person we're, we're, we're correcting. We're not, I'm not seeking people's destruction. I'm, seeing people, I'm seeking the brethren to get back on the right path. I've said this before. I'm against that false satanic teaching that there are things we can disagree on the Bible. The, Paul says time and time again, we're going to be of the same mind and of the same judgment, striving together. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. That's the opposite of, of striving together. When they're, This is talking about striving like arguing and fighting. But it says here, but be gentle unto all men. That includes lost people. I don't get into arguments with lost people. I used to, as a novice, as a babe in Christ, I got a little prideful. I'd get into arguments with lost people. I'd get, into, I'd get caught up in debates with lost people. No, I just need to try to preach the truth to them. If they don't want the truth, you're done. You don't get into arguments. You don't get into fights. You don't get into debates. You don't get to the point where there's contention where you start getting bitter towards that person. That bitterness can turn to anger, can turn to hate. And the whole point of you preaching the truth to somebody, let's say it's a lost person, is to see him get saved. If it's a brother or sister in Christ that's fallen down, is to see him get back up. You don't do it out of spite. You don't do it in bitterness. I've seen a lot of brethren attack each other in bitterness, wanting to seek in the destruction of each other. That's not of the Lord. Okay, that's of Satan. That's of the flesh. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach. I've pushed this time and time again, brothers and Christ. When you go to correct somebody, you do it through the scriptures, and you do it in a teaching way. You don't do it in a way of, I'm trying to destroy you. You do it in a way, I'm trying to teach you where you're wrong. I'm trying to show you your error to get you back on the right path. Teaching, and when you do teach, you have to be patient. You plant a seed. They might not get what you're saying the first time you tell them. It might take a while. And I've got testimonies on that. Disagreement with uh, the Godhead versus the Trinity. I was talking to a brother in Christ that he believed the Godhead of the King James Bible, but he had the hardest time giving up the pagan Trinity terms that aren't in the Scriptures, that are based off philosophy. It's the world's way of saying things. It's not God's way. 
And after a while, he was very mean and everything. And after a while, he got angry. And I'm, I pray I didn't get too angry. But when you have one side get angry, the, the first, you know, how do you say, the first reaction is then you get angry. And then he gets angry and you start really button heads. I pray I didn't butt heads with him too much. But later on down the road, several months later, he came back and he's like, you know what, I need to say it the Bible way. And I thank you for, for that correction. I thank you for not giving up on me and giving, that, giving me that correction. All right. They teach patient, verse 25, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. What's the opposite of being meek? Humble. I say meek, another word is humble. What's the opposite? Prideful, arrogant, coming across like a jerk. I'm not really here to correct you. I'm just to call you out in front of everyone else so I can look good and you can look bad. Because people love drama. People love drama. I've noticed that on YouTube, on video platforms, that if I am talk, if I make a video about a specific person just pointing out all his errors and just really laying into him, people are like, yay, it's drama, it's drama. But the truth is, is I'm using me as an example, because I see it with a lot of the brethren on here, that you go and try to talk to that person yourself. If I call someone out in by name 100%, Whole video is about calling him out and how wrong he is and how he's a danger to the body of Christ. Did I go and talk to the person himself first and try to get him on the right path? I'm talking about with brethren. I understand there's a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing. I do Bible studies that disagree. A lot of my Bible studies disagree with a lot of the wolves in sheep's clothing here on YouTube. Okay. But if I'm going to call out someone that I've called a brother in Christ, someone I believe is saved and born again, I love you, brother, I'm here for you, brother, I'm praying for you, brother, supporting you in ministry, brother, I'm here to help you in ministry, brother, if you need advice, brother. If I'm acting like that and I'm saying that, I better go to that person and talk to him before I open my big mouth and make a video about him. Okay. And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Notice it says instructing those that oppose themselves. You go to the person that needs the instruction. You don't yell at a camera. I've seen that happen a lot. I see a lot of brethren causing division, causing an uproar, because they think it's, it's better to just yell at a camera than actually go to the person that needs the correction. That's not love. That's cowardice. That's being a coward. I'm going to call them out. That's being a coward. When I've mentioned names, I try not to mention names too much, but when I mention names, I've tried going to these people and I've tried reasoning with them with the scriptures. I've tried talking to them about the truth. They just don't want it. Then I make a video. But we're, I'm getting ahead of myself. You go to them and try to reason with them with the truth. We've done a study on this before in the past. The way to correct a brother in Christ. You go to them one on one, then you bring another witness. For two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So to, you bring a couple other people that are witnesses to this person's failure, what he's doing wrong, this brother in Christ, and then that's the second time you, you correct him, after the first and second admonition. Reject. Then that sin rebuke before all. First you correct them, you bring some other brethren over, and, the, and like I said, this, the atmosphere and the heartfelt desire is to see him get corrected and get back on the right path. To stop doing what they're not supposed to be doing, or to start doing what they are supposed to be doing. Okay? And then the third and final one is you tell it to the whole church. Then you rebuke them for all. There's a step, there's a procedure in the Bible. Some people like to skip that first two steps and go straight to rebuking them before all in front of a camera. I get more views that way. And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. You go to the person first and foremost. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. That's your goal. You want to see them repent and get back on the right path. And get back on their feet. Verse 26. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. When you start getting into the lust of the flesh and worldliness... God will left, lift his protection and let Satan go at you sometimes. Don't you remember the story of Job? 
God can lift his protection and say, hey, go ahead, you can do this to Job. Yeah, you can hurt his flesh, just don't kill him. Satan still has to obey God, but God can lift his protection and allow Satan. That's why Paul says, give him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the soul may be saved. We put them out of our fellowship. There is justification for putting people out of your fellowship that hold and cling on to that sin, that error, and won't, won't do what's right by the Lord and won't obey the Word of God, won't line up with this book, with the life that they're living, and they're in sin and wickedness, and you have to kick them out of your fellowship. Why? So the chastisement of the Lord can happen, and then you can invite them back in when they get their heart right with the Lord, when they get that sin out. Amen. If God peradventure will give them to repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. This goes back to judgment we, we will face. It goes back why? Because we're all going to have to answer to God someday. And we're supposed to be here for one another. And we're supposed to be helping one another. And when we talk, when we talk about putting on the whole armor of God, when you get to the end, always praying and always watchful. And when it's talking about being watchful, you're being watchful for the brethren. Not just wolves in sheep's clothing, but you're to watch each other to make sure we're still walking and we're still doing what's right by the Lord. And we haven't given in to temptation over here. We haven't fallen over here. We're to be there for each other. To encourage one another to stay in the fight, to stay doing what is right. Why is the brethren, love of the brethren, wax so cold in these last days? Because men get puffed up with pride. Lust of the flesh. They then, they then turn around and start trying to defend sin. I've had brethren break fellowship with me, descend, defending at, I'm just obvious sin and wickedness. They try to defend the world's way and doing things the world's way. Or getting distracted by the world and what's going on in the world. Satan comes in with his ministers and starts whispering in their ear and they start turning from the truth and start turning to fables. And we're here trying to reach them for the truth. And what happens is some of the brethren, are, we're starting to see a lot of false brethren versus truly saved, but even some of the truly saved are losing their way big time. And you don't see the love of the brethren in them. All you see is love of self. Trying to defend something they shouldn't be defending. Now, let's get to sin. How is sin negative? Why is sin this so powerful that it can get in the way of the, your love for the Lord? It can get in the way of your love for His Word and handling the Word properly? Because there's brethren that are starting to, tr to mess this book up to justify their sin. They're trying to mess this book up to justify their choices in life. Them choosing the world. Okay. How is, why is sin so It's negative? Romans 8.12 right. Therefore, brethren, we are, not, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. When we, I was lost, I was a debtor to the flesh. And I was living after the flesh. I was carnally minded walking after the flesh. But when you get saved, we're not debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. That's the power of sin. But you know what's stronger than the power of sin? The love of the Lord, the love of God, His perfect written word, capital W word, and lowercase w word. But some people forget that sin has power and it has hooks. It's got claws. And once it gets into you, it tries to hold on. Okay. But here it is. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, we read, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? That's spiritual fellowship with the Lord. And if your spiritual fellowship with the Lord is messed up, your fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ is going to get messed up. If you're not handling the Lord right and His word right, you're not going to be handling the brethren right shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor, nor idolaters. I've said this before, I'll say it again. When you start putting things down here, brothers and sisters of Christ, and you start putting them and making them more important than the Lord and His Word 
and the ministry and the brethren and preaching the gospel to the lost world, living a life of Christ. In other words, that something down here is more important than the Lord and it comes before God. That thing, whether it be a person, an animal, a thing, like the hot rod, car that you have, or motorcycle, when you have something down here that's more important than the Lord, that item, that person, that thing becomes an idol. It becomes a lowercase g God because now that becomes before God. When you put anything between you and the Lord, it becomes an idol. Now wives and husbands can become idols. Paul warned about this, that you start falling in the trap of trying to please your wife over pleasing God, or pleasing your husband over pleasing God, pleasing your children over pleasing your God. But more importantly, when you're trying to please someone else, you're trying to please yourself first and foremost over God. God comes first. And there are brethren that have lost their way because God no longer comes first. Me, myself, and I come first. And the lust of the flesh in their life starts reigning supreme. The lust starts building up and getting out of control. They start becoming sinful, wicked, worldly. Neither fornication, nor idolatry, nor adulterers, nor feminine, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous. I'm hitting on these because these are the, they th seem like they're small things, but covetous. When you start coveting things down here, I want this. God says, no. This is what I want for you. Uh, Jonah, you're supposed to go to Nineveh. No, I want Tarsus. Going to Tarsus in itself isn't a sin. But when God says, I want you to go to Nineveh, and you choose Tarsus, now you're in sin because you're going against what God told you to do. And there's people down here who are coveting things down here that normally aren't a sin. But when you put it before the Lord, the Lord says, that's not what I have for you, that's not what I want for you, and they keep choosing it over the Lord, it becomes covetousness. I want to live my dream life. I want to have my dream family. I want to do things my way. And my, usually when you think covetousness, you think that big million dollar home, or you think money and stuff like that, or, I mean, or you know, other things. But some brethren are falling into covetousness when they start saying, I want to do things my way over God's way. I want what I want for me, and I'm going to fight God on what God wants for me. Like I said, there was nothing wrong with going to, to Nineveh, uh, Tarsus, as far as in itself. Anybody can go to Tarsus in itself, that's not the sin. The sin was is God didn't want Jonah going to Tarsus. God called Jonah to, to Nineveh. Covetousness, when you start coveting things down here, and in that covetousness, you start ignoring the Lord. You start ignoring what He wants for you. There's times where I started coveting other men's ministries because they had grand ministries or they had fellowship, everyone gets to sing, and, and I start, there's times where I was like, wow, I, I wish I could have that, and God's like, that's not what I have for you. That's not what I have for you. What I have for you is what you're doing right now. And you need to be content with that. Nor covetousness. That covetousness was getting in the way of my trusting the Lord and being content with what God has for me in ministry. Nor covetousness. Nor drunkards. Nor revilers. You know, name callers, mocking, name calling, bearing false witness putting people down, making videos against, your whole channel is just making videos against people, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. We're not supposed to be acting that way anymore. Such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit capital S, spirit of our God. In Romans chapter 8, it talks about the difference between being spiritually minded and walking after the Spirit, someone who's saved and born again, versus someone who's lost, carnally minded, and walking after the flesh. Okay, such so were some of you. There's supposed to be a changed life. Some of the brethren are starting to backpedal. I've been there myself. There's times where I've made mistakes. I'm not sinlessly perfect. I backpedal sometimes. I make mistakes. 
Sin will get in the way of your walk with the Lord, your prayer life, your Bible reading life. Remember that old saying that this book will keep me from my sins or my sin will keep me from, from this book? It will get in the way of your... I speak from experience. It will get in the way of your prayer life. Your prayer life will almost become non-existent. Your Bible reading life, you might flip on the channel to see what the brethren have put out on videos and you'll listen to the video in the background, but you're one-on-one -on -one with the Lord, reading the Word of God, talking to the Lord about the Word of God, it almost becomes non-existent. And then you stop watching the videos as much, the Bible study videos, and you're not even studying the Word of God as much. You realize you're spending most of your time in the lust of the flesh, the world, whatever it was that got in the way. And when a brother in Christ comes along and says, Hey, what you're doing there is getting in the way of your walk with the Lord. It goes against the Word of God. What's the reaction? Do they humble themselves? Hang their heads down. You're right. I shouldn't be doing this. This is getting in the way. I shouldn't have acted that way. I shouldn't have talked that way. I shouldn't have treated a brother and sister in Christ that way. Do you humble yourself and submit yourself to this book? Or are you one of those people that get up all angry and uh, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? You start acting like an enemy. You start acting hateful. The more I love you, the less I am loved. Because iniquity abounds, the love of many shall wax. The love of many shall wax cold. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Sin is negative. It's destructive. It'll always get in the way. Galatians chapter 5, 16. This I say then, walk in the capital S spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. If you're walking in the flesh, it's going to get in the way of the spirit, and you're doing, doing right. If you start getting in the flesh, it's going to get in the way of you understanding this book. Sin will get in the way. Sin will start messing you up. Walk in the flesh, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you walk, I'm sorry, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another. It goes back to that saying. Uh, I, people always say that's just talking about money. No, instruction righteous. When Jesus is saying you can't serve two masters, you'll either love one and hate the other, or you'll either cling to the one and despise the other. Then he uses the example of money. You can't love God and money. That's the example of what he's trying to teach. He's saying you can't serve two masters. What are we seeing here? Two masters. You have the spirit and the flesh, and they're two masters, and you can't serve both. You can either serve the capital S spirit, or you can serve the flesh. You can't do both. Why? Because one, you'll always have one that you lift above the other that you will hold above the other. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another, so that, th that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Here it is, given the definition. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies. We're in the falling away. The brethren are fighting each other tooth and nail. They're not treating each other like brothers and sisters of Christ. They're treating them like enemies. Everything we're reading here, do you fail any of this? I had to check myself. Are you failing any of this? Heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revilings. And such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That fellowship, that spiritual kingdom, that fellowship with the God, it'll always get in the way. It'll also start getting in the way of your fellowship with the brethren. For we are all one in Christ Jesus. We're the body of Christ. It's going to affect how you treat your brother and sister in Christ and how you react to correction. 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, fruit, goodness, and faith. The fruit of the Spirit. Love. What gets in the way of love? The fruits of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. What destroys your joy and your peace? When you start backpedaling and start getting back into the world and worldliness. 
long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith, meekness, and meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, temperance, we're talking about being patient, not quick to anger. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. That changed life. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Now, provoking one another. First thing that you think of is, okay, I'm not supposed to tempt my brother. I'm supposed to set a good example for my brother. And sister in Christ, they're supposed to be setting examples for me. We're supposed to be setting examples for each other. Paul says, follow us as you have us for an example. But at the same time, brother says Christ, when you go to correct somebody, if you come across as a jerk and you're doing it in a prideful manner, you're just going to be provoking him. You're going to be provoking him not to listen to you. And you're going to push him away from the truth and, and motivate them to do, continue doing what they're doing. You're not, because like I said, when someone comes at me as a jerk and very prideful and just yelling at me, you know the first thing that comes up? A shield. I start defending myself. I could be 100% in the wrong, but it's just a normal reaction that someone just comes at you just attacking you. The first thing you do is you throw up a shield. You start protecting yourself. You start defending yourself. And like I said, you could be 100% wrong, but it's still a reaction. That's why God knows what he's doing when he says in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. You come to someone as a friend, as a brother in Christ, and say, listen, friend, listen, brother. I saw you doing such and such. Doesn't the Bible say that's wrong? Let's look at it. Let's go through the scriptures. Let's get you back on the right path. Okay. We're not supposed to be provoking one another, and we're not supposed to be envying one another. Oh, look at that guy. He's getting away with it. No, he isn't. Look at that preacher on there. Just, you know, he's putting on a show, and he's, 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 he's making a lot of money. He's living his dream life with his dream wife or his dream husband. Or, that's a preacher. So his dream wife and children, and, and he's got boats. He's got RVs. He's got, you know, multiple properties. multiple. He's got it all, and you start envying him. Don't. Stay true to the Word of God no matter what. You got people out there with millions of dollars because they compromise, compromise. I don't believe they're saved, but they're compromising. Comp envying one of them. Don't envy them. When someone's doing wrong and doing these sins and falling into this trap, that list we just read, don't envy them thinking, wow, they're getting away with it and getting indulged in the flesh. Man, why can't I do that? For we all must uh, answer to the Lord. It says, Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. For we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Paul talks about, for those of us who are saved. For we must all stand at the judgment seat of Christ. They're not getting away with it. Romans 13, 12 says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Remember we read that. Let us walk honestly in the day, and in writing, and drunkenness, not in climb, uh, chambering, and wantonness, not in strife, and envying. Remember we just read up there in Galatians 5, uh, 25, envying one another, provoking one another. Thing. What does this? Sin. Sin is very destructive. Sin is negative. It's, it has no, it's not supposed to, you're supposed to have the attitude that it should have no place in the life of a Christian. We're supposed to do our best to keep it out. And when it comes in, we get a chance to correct ourselves. The Holy Spirit convicts us. God will bring someone into our life to correct us. To get us back on the right path. God will chasten us to get us back on the right path. Not in strife, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. What keeps you from putting on the Lord Jesus Christ? When you start making provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You let a little bit in, and it's going to start destroying you. You've got to have a zero tolerance for sin in your life. Okay, That's how ne sin is negative. And when sin comes in, it's so negative, it's very destructive. And like Paul said, when he started correcting people, when he started rebuking people, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? The more I love, the less I am loved. 
Now, Brothers Chris, I've mentioned this before. How are we supposed to give correction? Are we supposed to come across as being a... I always use the word jerk, but you're coming across because your heart's not in the right place. I'm not correcting this person because I want to see this person get back on the right path. I'm correcting this person, and I'm doing it in a way that sounds like debating or arguing, like, like adversarial, because it gets me clicks on YouTube. It gets me more views on YouTube. It's what the people want. Okay? There's a way that God says we're supposed to correct people, and the brethren aren't doing it. You're not following it, brothers and sisters Christ. Some of you are, but I, for the ones that aren't, I'm talking to you. You're not following it. First and foremost, you go to the guy and talk to him that's in the wrong. Then you bring a couple witnesses with you. Then you tell it to the whole church and put that person out. There's steps and how you talk to a brother in Christ. You don't talk to him like he's an enemy. We'll get to those verses right here. Galatians 6.1 Going back to Galatians 6, 1 again. It says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. I'm sorry, I thought we were going back to 2 Timothy. Galatians 6, 1. Uh, restore such a one in the meekness of, or what, spirit of meekness. Because we're going to get back to 2 Timothy 2, 25, where it says, In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. In meekness. It says, Consider thyself. Hey, I was just like him. I've made mistakes too. I'm not perfect. I want someone to come to me when they're coming to correct me. I want them to do it out of love and in meekness, showing me the truth and having the desire to see me get back on the right path. Consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You're supposed to do it in meekness. And the temptation there is, is you're trying to correct a brother in Christ that's in sin. You don't want to start being in sin yourself. And how you're correcting them. Getting prideful, that's a sin. Holding bitterness in your heart, it's a sin. Hating your brother, or starting to act like he's an enemy, and you're starting to hate your brother or sister in Christ, you're now in sin. The Bible says if you sin against the brethren, you sin against Christ. How you correct them can be a sin if you do it the wrong way. Verse 2, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. What's going on? How people are correcting one another. You get so puffed up, you get so prideful, and you forget that, hey, you might not have made the exact same mistake that person's made, but boy, you've made some mistakes. When I correct someone, I always have to remind myself, hey, we're doing it out of love. Because there's times where I can be frustrated with some of the brethren. Boy, do I get frustrated with some of the brethren. But i got to calm down and remind myself to do it out of love when I correct them. And remind myself that, hey, I make mistakes too. I've made mistakes too, and brethren have come to me in love and corrected me and got me back on the right path. I'm not better than he is. I'm not greater than he is. I would never dare make the mistake he made. You know, the pride, the ego. It's, you got to drop that pride and ego, and you got to humble yourself and in meekness. 2 Timothy, once again, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And the servant of the Lord must not strive in the spirit of meekness. Restore one, store such a one in the spirit of meekness. The Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. And meekness. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that's what your goal. You want to see them repent and get back on the right path. But some of the brethren, their goals, that isn't it. They'll say it, but remember, words and deeds need to line up. Their deeds say, I'm trying to destroy this man. How they come across it, they don't have any love for him. They just want to destroy him. And then when they get caught, they're like, Oh, I just I wanted to see him get back on the right path. You're a liar. Because how you came across, you were trying to destroy the man. You're trying to crucify the man. You're trying to make the man or, or, or woman, the brother or sister in Christ, look so bad and you look so good, trying to hide some of your faults and your sins. To repentance, the acknowledging of the truth, that's our goal. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. 1 Corinthians 4.21 says, What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod? Or in love? And the spirit of meekness? Question mark. 
There was times in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, these guys were getting into so much sin and wickedness. Fornication was one of the big ones. And fornication is a, is one of the, is a great sin in the sense it's a sin against the flesh Paul talks about. And he talked about that if I came to, if I, if I was there right here and now, he's right, I'm just paraphrasing because I don't have this in the, <laughs> but he's saying that I'm so angry with you, I'd lose it. I'd be using a rod. I'd be beating you with a rod. You're lucky that I haven't come to you, but when I do come to you, he's going to try to do it in the meekness, in the spirit of meekness. The sin that they were doing really upset him. When people are coming in in Galatians and, and messing up the gospel, it upset Paul. But you're never going to win people to Christ with a rod of with a rod, with an iron a rod. I was thinking rod of iron when Jesus comes back, but with a rod. Today we're supposed to be humble. We're supposed to do it in meekness. We're supposed to be gentle to all men. I've read those verses. Patient, apt to teach. Okay. First Timothy First Timothy five nineteen we read against an elder receive not an accusation but before two or three witnesses. You can take, an elder can take an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. That goes back to, like I said, when I go to correct somebody one-on-one, -on -one, I'll do it. Then you're supposed to take a second person with you before two or three witnesses. And when you have an elder in the church, an elder in the faith, you see that, hey, he's kind of fallen to the left, he's kind of fallen to the right. You need to have, you need to have uh, two or three witnesses. You do not publicly rebuke someone else that's in ministry, an elder in the ministry. You don't publicly rebuke him by yourself. Before two or three witnesses, let every word be established, the Bible teaches. Verse 20, Then that sin rebuke before all, that others may fear. And I would put this, in, I under, underline this because it's like them that sin rebuke before all. And people take that out of context. They'll say, well, that means that anytime I see a brother in Christ sin, I go straight to the camera. When I see a brother in Christ in error, when I see a brother in Christ make a mistake, when I see a brother in Christ sin, I go straight to the camera and I rebuke him before all. No. What this is saying is, right there it just says, against an elder received not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Then that sin rebuke before all. It's saying it doesn't matter what the situation is. There's no respect of persons. You rebuke them. If there's nobody around, then there's nobody around. You don't wait for an audience. If you see a person in sin, you correct them on the spot. You don't wait for an audience. If there is an audience, you don't say, well, there's too many people around. I better keep my mouth shut for right now. No, you still correct them. You go to that person, you correct them, and you try to win them back to, to the Lord. Win them back to what's right. And if they refuse to, then you rebuke them before all. Okay? The others may fear. I charge thee, therefore, I charge thee before God and the Lord, Jesus Christ, and the elect angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one another, doing nothing by partiality. So when it's talking about them that rebuke before all, it's talking about when it gets to that step, it's time that you've tried, I went to him, he won't listen. I took two or three witnesses with him, he wouldn't listen. Now we tell it to the church. We don't have partiality, we don't let anybody, you know, well, you know, he's, he, he's a great man of God, so we're going to let him slide. We're going to let him slide. Okay, we're just going to let him slide. No. That's what this is talking about. But some people have taken it too far by saying, well, did, I'll ask them, did you go to the person and try to win him to Christ? Did you try to win him back to the truth? No, I just went straight to the camera and just rebuked him. You don't love him. True love is going to that person and trying to win him back to the truth. Correcting them, instructing them. Uh, Brothers of Christ, without preferring one another... Preferring one before another. Remember, God's not a respecter of persons. Now, when it comes to temptation, brothers, says Christ, I want to throw this in there. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. That goes back to not making provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You've got to avoid wickedness. And the number one place you're going to have that avoids wickedness is your home. When you start letting sin back into your own home, 
That's when you're really going to start getting messed up. When you start, your home is not, God's not the head of your home. Remember the order of authority. God, man, woman, child. It's order of authority. If God is not the head of the man, and the man's not the head of the woman, and the woman's not the head of the children, your house is not in order, okay, you're gonna, it's going to get messed up. It's, today, this world is so wicked. We started this out with the world being so wicked that sin is at your fingertips. I'm pointing over here at the internet. Sin is at your fingertips. Lust of the flesh is at your fingertips. It's everywhere you go. So the number one place is supposed to be abstained from all appearance of evil is your home. Psalms 111, uh, 101, Psalms 101, verse 3 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside, and it shall not cleave to me. Yes, it's supposed to bother us when we see brethren that are doing the wrong thing. I'm not saying you're wrong for being bothered or upsetting you. No, I'm just saying when you come across, you've got to... If you're getting too heated, you're getting too angry, you need to take a step back and go take a walk. And you need to calm down. Then come back to them and have, be in the right heart and the right mindset to correct them and get them back on the right path. Set no wicked thing before thine eyes when it comes to temptation. Romans 13, 14 says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Amen. Brothers and Christ, we don't go into wicked places or participate in sin to correct people. Okay, I've seen this a long time. Oh, um, when it comes, mainly for like with people who claim to be witnessing. Oh, we're going to witness for Jesus Christ. We're going to go to these topless bars to witness for His life. We're going to go to these porn events to witness for Jesus Christ. We're going to go to these uh, sodomite events to witness for Jesus Christ. You put no you're supposed to abstain from all appearance of evil. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. You don't get into an area where you're starting to tempt yourself. I am a video game addict. I don't go to video game stores to witness for Jesus Christ. Okay? I know my addictions. I know my faults. I know my weaknesses. And when that sin is a thorn you have in your own flesh, you have to be cautious. Brothers that justify Hollywood movies, video games, anime, cartoons, worldly music, holidays, uh, you know, doing things, correct, correct them. And if they will not repent, flee. Kind of, move, kind of moving the teaching over a little bit into the part when you're correcting someone, how do you correct somebody? You correct them, and if they won't take the correction, you move on. If the sin that they're doing is something you have a problem with, you have a struggle with, it's a thorn in your own flesh, then you do your best to correct them and be and use your own testimony as a witness. And when they won't listen, you run. You're done with them. Do not keep fellowshipping with them. We have studies on this, on uh, when it's okay to fellowship and when it's not okay to fellowship. Okay, is sin justification to break fellowship? Absolutely. If they're struggling with sin, I say no. If they're struggling with sin that you have a struggle with and it's starting to tempt you, then yes. If they're justifying sin across the board, I mean, if they're just justifying it and vehemently holding on to it, yes, that's justification to break fellowship. But remember, you put them out for the destruction of the flesh so the soul may be saved so they can repent and come back in. You're not seeking their destruction. 2 Kings, 2 Kings 9, an Old Testament passage. 1 Kings, 2 Kings. I say, what does this remind me of when I said, correct them and if they will not repent, flee? This reminded me of an Old Testament story. 2 Kings 9. 2 Kings 9. And Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets and said to him, Gird up thy loins and take this box of oil in thine hands and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when thou comest thither, look out there, Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nishu, and go in and make him arise up from among his brethren and carry him into an inner chamber and take the box of oil, pour it on his head, and say, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then open the door and flee. Tarry not. He went to give the message he was supposed to give and flee and tarry not. And you keep, you keep reading all the way to 10. 
If you want to pause the video, keep reading the story down to 10. He goes and tells the message he's supposed to to. He anoints the guy, and then he flees. There's times where God will use you to correct somebody, and God knows whether they're going to accept it or not. We don't. But God knows whether they're going to accept it or not. And there's times where you've got to do what God called you to do, and then when it's done, you've got to flee. If they won't take the correction, you move on. If the correction you're giving them, once again, is a thorn in the flesh that you have, that you struggle with, people say you can be a, it's a hypocrite. No, a hypocrite is someone who justifies it, and when someone else does it, they call them out. That's a hypocrite. But I can call out people for playing video games and Hollywood movies and TV shows and satanic style music, even though my flesh, I have that addiction myself that God's got me clean of, praise God, but it's always there in my head. I'm always having to bring my thoughts in subjection to the beings of Christ. I'm always being tempted. Okay? I can still call it out, but I know it's a thorn in my flesh as well. So if they're going to say, oh, I don't care, I'm going to keep it and whatnot, then I, I can't have anything to do with you. I'm going to flee. I'm not going to fellowship with you. And there were brethren on here I couldn't fellowship with. I never could. Because they were justifying Hollywood movies, TV shows, and video games. Okay? So when we give correction, brothers and Christ, how do we do it? We do it in meekness. We do it with love. We do it by preaching the truth. We use the Word of God to correct. Okay? But we do it in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. We're gentle on the man. We do it in a teaching manner. We do it with a heartfelt desire to see whoever we're correcting or rebuking, we want them to get back on the right path. We want to get them back to doing what's right, not doing what's wrong. We're not seeking their destruction. We're not, like I said, we're not doing it because of pride and envy and ego and trying to make get views on YouTube. Now we're going to switch around giving correction. Now I'm going to switch around how do you take correction. Oh, I love giving correction. Yeah, you love giving correction, but how are you at taking it? I know brethren, great, we used to be great men of God. I know men in ministry that have gotten so proud, they love to give the correction, but they don't love taking it. In fact, they hate taking correction. They're starting to act like they're above correction. They're above reproach and reproof. Ephesians 5.21, Ephesians 5.21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. We're supposed to submit ourselves to one another. If someone comes to us and says, hey, can I talk with you about something, and they're trying to correct us, there's times I've had people come to me to try to correct me, and I showed them in the Bible where I, I, I line up with the Bible, and I ended up correcting them when they came to correct me. There's times they came to correct me, and I look and go, you know what? The Bible's right. I'm wrong. They're right. They line up with the Bible. I don't. And I, I had to take the correction. We're supposed to be submitting ourselves one to another. You're not above correction. Now, I understand men in ministry, you have a lot of false converts. You have the wicked world. They're always trying to attack you, attack you, attack you. But I'm saying I've seen some of these men get so hard-hearted that when they come across a brother in Christ, that they call a brother in Christ, that they fellowship with, they've invested time with, I love you, brother. I'm here for you, brother. The moment that person comes and tries to correct them, they treat them like an enemy. We're supposed to be submitting ourselves one to another. Peter 5.5 5 says, 1 Peter 5.5, 5, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. You know who the most humble person is in the Bible? I'll say outside Jesus Christ. Outside Jesus Christ, because some people hit. The most number one person that's most humble outside of Jesus Christ was Moses. Go and read about Moses. When they came to correct him they, and they were in the wrong, he would still humble himself. He didn't get prideful and puffed up. Go read about the stories. Of Moses. When, the, when Israel kept coming to him, he had the Levites come and challenge whether you know, Aaron should be the high priest and uh, Moses the prophet, then you had Aaron and, and uh, Miriam come up and question Moses, being the only man to speak for God. And you had these people who would come, and you'd look at how Moses would act. He would humble himself. He bowed himself before these people that were making a false accusation against him. 
and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Now, I've seen men in ministry where they start putting out videos of how you need this ministry, how important this ministry is. Or, are you guys afraid of me? Are you afraid of little old me? How important this ministry is. Where's the humbleness? You need this ministry. I'm, the, I'm a great man of God. I'm the only Bible-believing preacher on YouTube. Where's the humility? And you wonder why these guys have a hard time taking correction. They love giving it, but they have the hardest time taking it. Proverbs 3.11 we read, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. We're not supposed to be weary of God's correction, and God can use brothers and sisters of Christ to correct people. He can use elder women in the church to correct the younger women, and he can use elder men in the church to correct the younger men, and the younger men can correct elders. You can, you, you learned the story about Job. You had his three friends, and then this, I forgot the fourth guy's name, but the fourth guy comes in, he's a younger man, he's been keeping quiet the whole time, and he corrects those three elder men. There is a time and place for a younger man to correct an older man. But the point is, is when correction comes around, we need to try to listen to it. Now, like I said, if someone comes to correct me and I show them the scriptures, that the scriptures are right, they're wrong. I try to have an open door policy. When someone has a problem with something I said or something I'm teaching or preaching, come talk to me. Why? Because I'm not above correction. I could have made a mistake. And you never know. I might be able to turn around and show them where they're wrong and they need to line up with this book like I line up with this book. But you have people that they start to hate correction. They love to do the correcting, but they hate taking it. Proverbs 15, 9 says, The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. Met these men in ministry. Uh, the, the brethren as a whole, brothers and sisters of Christ as a whole, correction is grievous unto them that forsaketh the way. And he that hateth reproof shall die. When they start getting into the flesh and worldliness, whatever it is that they're doing their error, when they start getting prideful, like when they're wrong on this, they start holding on to pride. That's the sin that they're holding on to, that fleshliness. That's why they hate correction, because they love their sin. They become very fleshly. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 3. We're going back to the Old Testament. Jeremiah verses, chapter 5 verse 3. O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. The chastening of the Lord. I've seen some people, mainly I've seen lost people, where God has broken them time and time again. He will break them to lead them to Christ, and they reject Christ every time. And after every time they get broken, they harden their heart. They harden their heart. Same thing with brethren. The chastening of the Lord. I see the chastening of the Lord. They'll, cut, they'll claim it's the enemy attacking me, and it's just the enemy and everything. No, I've seen the Lord chasten brethren. And every time they refuse to accept that chastening, their heart just gets a little harder. They get a little bit more prideful. They start becoming va vanity starts going crazy in their life. They start becoming vain. It's all about them. Have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. Goes back to like I said. They start harden. The heart starts getting a little harder. Starts getting a little harder. They have refused to return. In Jeremiah chapter 7, a couple chapters down, over, uh, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 28, But thou shalt say unto them, This is the nation that obeyeth not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished, and is cut off from their mouth. We're in the last days. Okay? We are supposed to be able to take correction as much as we are supposed to give out correction. But what's preventing? Everyone wants to correct everyone, but nobody seems to want to take correction these days. 
and I've seen among the brethren. I'm not calling everybody out, but most. I'm just saying this is an affection, a disease in the body of Christ. Everybody wants to correct everybody, but nobody wants to take correction. We're all supposed to be submitting ourselves one to another. We're all supposed to be ready to be corrected if we need to be corrected as much as we are supposed to be ready to correct a brother or sister in Christ when God opens that door and says it shows us, hey, this brother or sister in Christ needs correction. You need to be able to take correction as much as you give it. Because when you don't take correction, your heart starts hardening. That pride starts building up. And then it gets to the point where it's very hard to correct people like that. And I know some men in ministry that are very hard to correct. Almost impossible. I won't say impossible because with God, all things are po all things are possible. God can break through that hard heart. God can break through that pride. What do we do? We pray for one another. Brothers and Christ, are you praying for one another? When you correct somebody, do you say, okay, I'm done with you? I've, I've had brethren say that. Okay, try to preach the truth to them. If they don't want the truth, and I've said it too sometimes, then you're done with them. Uh, no, you're not. I'm wrong. This is me taking a correction. I'm not. I'm wrong. I'm not done with them. What do you do next? You pray for them. I pray God sends someone else in their life that they will listen to. I pray God will break them to the point of getting them to see the truth of what they've become and that they get back to that standing point and I keep praying for them. There's brothers in Christ that I've lost fellowship with that I miss. I love my brothers in Christ. I pray for them to this very day. I pray for them. We're not done with them. Oh, just kick them to the curb like they're nothing. No, you pray for them. How we correct and don't be above taking correction. And I said we'd talk about this real quick. I know it's been a long video if you're still with me. I talked about how Paul said wolves come in not sparing the flock. How we have false converts coming in. False brethren coming in and spreading iniquity. How do they cause division in the body of Christ? When false converts come in and they start spreading iniquity, they start justifying the flesh. They start spreading pride. They start spreading covetousness, idolatry. They start spreading sin. Oh, the Hollywood movies, TV shows, it's no big deal. Drunkenness, yeah, you probably shouldn't get drunk. But drinking a little bit here and there, knowing that you know you have a problem with it, Drinking a little bit here is not a big deal, and that gets you to be back into fleshliness. 2 Corinthians 11.26 says, this is Paul, he says, In journeyings often, and perils of waters, and perils of robbers, and perils by mine own countrymen, and perils by the heathen, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the seas. It sounds like that if you're standing for the truth, you're going to go through a lot of perils. When you're doing the work of the Lord and God calls you places, He could call you to a place that's not 100% safe. But you trust the Lord to protect you in that area. But more than anything, you have Paul. He says, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? The more I love you, the less I am loved. His, his job is to go around and, and preach the, the gospel. The mystery of the gospel is revealed to Paul and he's preaching it to the Gentiles. And he tries to preach it to the Jews too sometimes. He's going through all these perils, but here's one, in perils among false brethren. What's that peril? They're coming in, they're bringing sin, wickedness, worldliness, doctrines of devils, lies and deceit. And they're trying to infect the, the saved brothers and sisters in Christ with it. And what they do is they end up causing, uh, they cause uh, division, the headbutting. I remember in an old study we talked about this, that one of the things that causes us to butt heads a lot is when you have someone come in that's a false convert, they'll start spreading lies and promoting sin and flesh and worldliness, and then they sit back and they watch two Christians fight at each other, and they love it. They got two saved brothers and sisters in Christ to fight each other, and they love that. Okay, Paul had a problem with that with false brethren. Galatians 2.9, he says... And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in unawares. Once you know that they're false, you put them out of your fellowship. You pray for them. I used to say you have nothing to do with them. You have nothing to do with their false gospel. You have nothing to do with their sin, their wickedness, their worldliness, their false doctrine, doctrine of devils. And you pray for them. But because of false brethren, unaware brought in, who came out privily to spy out your liberty which we have in Christ Jesus. 
I'm not going to get into too much, but that liberty that's in Christ Jesus is being liberated from the law of sin and death. And that Jesus is the one that liberated us. And they're trying to get you back under, I can do it myself. Get back you under the, you know, the true plan of salvation. Jesus paid for my sins. He liberated me from the law of sin and death. People come in and try to get you back under the law of sin and death. That's what's happening here in Galatians. They try to get you back under the Levitical laws and getting you going through the Levitical laws in order to be saved. That they might bring us into bondage. They're bringing in sin. They're bringing in a false gospel. That's sin. But you have false brethren. Philippians chapter 3 verse 17. Philippians chapter 3 verse 17. And this is Paul. When it comes to these false converts that come in, they have no problem adding to the Word of God. They have no problem subtracting from the Word of God. They have no problem promoting worldliness. I got accused the other day of being, well, you're one of those hardcore Christians. Because I'm doing my best to stand for this book and the life that I'm living. Oh, you're one of those hardcore Christians because I was kicking sin. I was kicking worldliness. He thought he was putting me down. That's a compliment. I'm one of those hardcore... You mean I'm an actual Christian? I'm actually in Christ? I'm actually obeying Christ, my Lord and Savior? I'm actually bought with a price? I'm not my own? Philippians 3.17 Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk as ye have... So as ye have us for an example... Where it says, follow us as you have us for an example. Be follow Paul says, be follows me as I am of Christ. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. If you're following Paul and the Pauline epistles, you're following Christ. Verse 18. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. What did we read? We actually turned there. Where it talked about whose God is their belly. I'm oh, sorry, God... Uh, who have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. They're the enemies of the cross of Christ. Verse 19, Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Brothers and sisters of Christ, we need to watch out for false converts coming in and promoting sin and wickedness and worldliness. Coming in, I've, I've had brethren that, I've had to make videos, and it's like, they once stood for the true plan of salvation, but then an enemy comes in and talks them out of the true plan, the, the plan of salvation that they got saved off of and get them to water it down and compromise the gospel. Get them back under sin and wickedness. Get them back under worldliness. Get them back under false doctrine, like the post of mid-trib. Get them back under false doctrine, uh, the Trinity. Ephesians 5.11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Once again, we need to prove ourselves and be approved by the brethren. And that's one of the biggest things. How are these false converts able to come in and promote lusts of the flesh and destroy the love of the brethren? And cause the brethren to, to scatter. Division. That's what it means by scattering the sheep. Division. How do they destroy the love of their... They come in and they bring worldliness. They bring lusts of the flesh. They bring in sin and wickedness and worldliness. They bring in the, the attitude that man can be the final authority, not the Lord. Mm -hmm. And the reason they, they're coming in so much in the body of Christ today is because we're not proving people and making sure that we're approving ourselves one to another and proving each other. Oh, I'm one of you. Prove it. You can ask me the same thing. Prove it. We're not making people prove themselves. If they say they're a Bible-believing Christian, we just accept them in with open arms. No, you need to prove it. Especially in these last days with the falling away. Prove it. Romans 12.2 says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. All scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. 
that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? 2 Corinthians 8.8 8 says, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forward, for, forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. Prove. We have, hosted, uh, uh, we have a video study on proving yourself. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Someone says, I'm saved. No, prove it. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates, worthless, fakes, frauds, counterfeits. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Why? Because it talks about what many false prophets. I think many false prophets have gone out into the world. There's fakes. There's frauds out there. Galatians 6.4 But let every man prove his own work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Prove all things. Brothers is Christ, we need to make sure that we're proving ourselves to each other and we're proving all things. We're not all talk or walk. Our walk lines up with our talk. We're not making people prove themselves and these false converts are coming in and they're, they're fooling everybody. Why? Because you're not using this to prove them. They get you to not use this to prove. Who are you to judge me? He the spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. We just look at prove all things. Let every man prove his own work. Prove your own selves. Okay. False converts are coming in and they're bringing in wickedness and sin and folly and, and worldliness. And they're turning on this book little by little. And what's their goal? To, to divide the sheep, to scatter the sheep, to see us fight amongst ourselves and devour one another. Division, butting heads. Brothers and Christ, we're supposed to be of the same mind and the same judgment, striving together. We're supposed to be one body. We're all supposed to be one in Christ Jesus. And lately, we're not acting like it. And once again, if you see someone that's fallen to the left or fallen to the right, and you've called them a brother in Christ, you need to go help them. True love for them is preaching the truth to them. It always just irritates me that I've had men turn on me like ravening wolves that won't come to me. And they once said, I love you, brother. I'm here for you, brother. I'm praying for you, brother. But they won't dare come talk to me. They just kick me to the curb like I'm nothing. That's how the lost world treats each other. We're not supposed to be like the lost world. You see a brother in Christ, you go corrupt him. And you do it in meekness. You do it with love. And make sure that you're not above correction. Real quick, fake love. I just want to put, bring, bring this out real quick. It's a long study. <laughs> fake love. Be careful when we're talking about false converts. Be careful about fake love. The love of the world that the world promotes mostly is fake love. What they're really promoting is fleshliness. Lust of the flesh, a burning in the bosom, the flesh being moved. The Bible teaches that true love is an action. It's an act of your will. What's true love? Um, for the Lord, keeping His word. What's true love for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Preaching the truth to them. Being there for them. Exhorting them through the scriptures. Being there to help one another out. I can say I love a brother in Christ all I want. And every time he's needed help, I told him no. But I love you, brother. Every time he needed time to talk, sorry, I don't want to talk. But I love you, brother. I, I'm, I'm hurting and, and I have money that I can help him out with some food or pay a bill or two. And he comes to me saying, I need help, brother. And I say, sorry, I ain't helping. But I love you, brother. That's the world. They've destroyed the word love. That's not real love. Love is your actions. Your deed is what the love is. How we handle the word of God. How we treat our Lord and Savior. How we treat our brothers and sisters in Christ. How we treat the lost world. But you have fake love. How do we know this? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 6. By pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love un 
feigned. You know what that means? That there's love that is feigned. We're supposed to have unlo unfeigned love. We're supposed to have real love. Genuine love. For the Lord, for His Word, if you're in ministry, for the ministry, for the brethren, for the lost world. But if it says unfeigned, it's saying that, Paul's saying that, hey, there's feigned love out there. There's fake love out there. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. There's times that I wonder, there's times I do wonder, did these brethren ever actually love me? Or was it just something they said? It just became a salutation. It just became something you say. I love you, brother. It's just something you say. You don't have to mean it. It's like passing by some stranger and saying hello. I said this before. You pass, I come across strangers all the time, and, I, and they'll ask me, How are you doing? And they'll keep walking. They don't stop for an answer because it, it was supposed to be a question, but now it's just become some kind of salutation. It's just something you say, not something you mean. Unfeigned love of the brethren. You got people out here. I love you, brother. I'm here for you, brother. I'm praying for you, brother. And the moment we have a disagreement, the moment I correct them, sometimes I hope it never happens this way, but maybe they've corrected me and I need to drop my pride. But the thing is, is they don't even come to you and try to talk to you. They just kick you to the curb like you're nothing. What happened to I love you, brother? We're supposed to have unfeigned love of the brethren. If you ever said, I love you, brother, to me, and now you're acting like I'm a heretic and this, that, did you ever come and try to reach me for the truth? I don't think you loved me. I think you faked it. I think it's just something we're all taught to say. If someone professes to be in the body of Christ, we just accept everybody at their word, and we just say it as just a salutation. We don't have to actually mean it. I've had brethren really close to me that just kicked me to the curb like I'm nothing. What happened to the love? Was it real? Or was it fake? Romans 12, 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. Let love be without dissimulation. Unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Love unfeigned. And honor preferring one another. There's one of the big marks of a false convert. Uh, one of them is who they prefer to be around. Do they like to actually like being around hardcore Christians? Bible-believing, real Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women? Or do they prefer being around worldly Christians in the world and, and lost world? Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, putting other people first. Self-sacrifice, charity, self-sacrifice. Do the brethren come before you? Or does me, myself, and I always come first? My way of doing things, me living my dream life. Me doing things my... I can keep going on and on. Do the brethren come first? Or do you come first? Does God come first in your life? Or do you come first? Remember, order of, 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 of priority. God and His Word comes first. Your walk with the Lord comes first. The ministry comes second. If you get called into ministry. The brethren come third. The, the lost world is fourth. And Philip Newton is last. Is that you, brother, says Christ? Or have you gotten so puffed up in, in, in your lust and your flesh and your own pride that you come first? Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. I've seen brethren curse other people. Go to hell. I want you to go to hell. I'd love to see you go to hell. 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Sacrificing your time to be with brethren that are going through some hard times. That's what love is. The actions. How you treat your brothers and sisters in Christ determine whether you love them. It's not just a word you say. It's not just a feeling you have in your, in the, deep down in the bosom. The burning in the bosom. No. Love is how you treat people. 
If you love the Lord, you keep His words. It's your actions. If you love your brother says Christ, you'll see it by the fruit, by your actions. Be of the same mind one towards another. Mind not high things, but consent to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing he shall reap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Have you forgotten to love your brother? Real, what real love is? Have you forgotten it? Has it become something you just say all the time? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, when I got to that, it says, but it says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. A lot of these false converts with this fake love, they're, they're, they're just being evil. They're rewarding evil with evil. 1 Thessalonians 5.14, I see some brethren falling into that. We're in the Old Testament over here. 1 Thessalonians. First Thessalonians 5.14 says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. goes back to correction. Warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. What do we read up there? Weep with them that weep. Rejoice with them that rejoice. Weep with them. Uh, comfort the feeble-minded. People that aren't as smart as, as you think you are. You know, when you start thinking you're more highly than someone else. Support the weak. Be patient towards all men. Here it is right here, 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and all men. We don't render evil for evil. That's not love. When you have someone say, I love you, but they're rendering evil for evil, that's not love. That's fake love. They're not showing real love. Oh, he calls me names, I'm going to call him names. He mocks me, I'm going to mock him. He, he backbites and whispers about me, I'm going to backbite and whisper about him. He bears false witness about me, I'm going to bear false witness about him. I've had brethren hurt me. I really have. But my love for them, I will not treat them the way they treated me. You don't render evil for evil. That's not real love. That's fake love. Brothers, says Christ, have you forgotten who we are to one another? Have, we, have you forgotten? 1 Timothy 5.1 says, Rebuke not an elder, we read this, but entreat him as a father. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father? And the younger men as brethren? And the elder women as mothers? The younger sisters with all purity. The younger the younger women as sisters. We're all family. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. The elder women in the faith are to be treated like mothers. The elder men in the faith are supposed to be treated like fathers. We're a family. Have you forgotten that? Something, it just becomes something we say, oh yeah, brothers and sisters in Christ, it just becomes a salutation, something we all say. But have you forgotten, spiritually, we're all in the same family. We're all part of the body of Christ. We're all in Christ Jesus. We're all one in Christ Jesus. We're in a family now. Have you forgotten that? Some people forget when they start yelling at some of the elder men in the faith. That's a fault. You're supposed to treat that like a father. Would you treat your father that way? Elder women in the faith, like a mother, would you treat your mother that way? If you had an actual brother or a sister, a physical brother or sister, would you treat them the way you're treating some of your brothers and sisters in Christ? 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6 says, Now we commend you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Have you forgotten who we are one to another? Will you withdraw from the brother? Withdraw yourself from every brother, not enemy, 
Not monster. You don't treat him like a monster, an enemy. You don't treat him like dirt. It says, from every brother that walketh disorderly. Then you get into 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14. Jump down to verse 14. It says, And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. You put him out of your fellowship. But verse 15 says, Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Have you forgotten who we are one to another? We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're a family. And we're supposed to do what's right by each other. Thank you for being bearing with me for this long of a study. But finally, brothers and Christ, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. There's another one. We're children of God. We're all children of God. That's what makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love. As Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice of God for a sweet-smelling savor. Are you willing to put your life on the line for the brethren? Sacrifice your time, your abundance. Are you willing to risk losing a brother in Christ by preaching the truth to him? That's love. There's a sacrifice. Notice it talked about the sacrifice of God for a sweet-smelling savor. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. A living sacrifice. Ephesians 5, 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. When their words don't line up with this. When they're not rightly dividing. 2 Timothy 2.15 But with good words and fair speeches. I was telling, talking to a sister in Christ about that. So good words and fair speeches, oftentimes, they don't line up with this. They line up with the flesh. They appeal, those good words and fair speeches appeal to the flesh. They appeal to the world. They tend to line up with Satan in his way. Counterfeit. Vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not that ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Make sure you're doing self-examination and you're proving yourself every day, brother says Christ. Living sacrifice. I have to risk it, Brother Christ. I have to put my all. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? I have to risk losing fellowship with brethren. Because in these last days, you have no clue. One minute you could correct a brother in Christ and he takes it. The next minute you correct a brother in Christ and you lose him in fellowship. But Brother says Christ, we need to stand for what's right and we need to do what is right. Love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Iniquity in the body of Christ is what I believe is really dividing the body of Christ in these last days. Why is the love of the brethren wax cold? <laughs> you know, because iniquity abounds. Why was Paul, the more he loved you, the less he's loved? We preach the truth. And part of that truth is correction, uh, for, uh, is doctrine, for reproof, for correction. Reproof and correction is part of that telling the truth. And today, everyone's just at each other's throats because somebody's holding on to some kind of sin and worldliness that they won't let go of. I had a brother in Christ break fellowship with me, and he, he came out and admitted what he, what he was defending had nothing to do with the Word of God. It was, had to do with the world, culture. 
worldliness. But he proved that the world was more important than fellowship with the brother in Christ. And that that worldliness was worth sacrificing a brother in Christ. It's destroying the brethren, brother says Christ. We need to get back to the truth. We need to get back to the word of God. We need to get back to living right. And more importantly, we need to get back to not being above taking correction. Giving it, if we can give it, we can take it. If you can't give it, I mean, if you can't take it, then you shouldn't be giving it. It's that simple. If you can't take correction, don't, don't give it. If you, can give, if you can give correction, you better be able to take it. Luke 9.23 says, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross daily and follow me. Humble yourself. Meekness. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, 1 through 5. This is Paul. Remember, everyone's at each other's throat. We're butting heads. Everyone's fighting everyone. everyone I'm of so-and-so. I'm of this person. We talked about that respecter of persons, that cult of personality, where you start worshiping a man that isn't Jesus Christ. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you. And peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that what you want for the brethren? Grace be to you and peace from God our Father. Or are you causing problems? Verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil war world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This world isn't it. This isn't forever. This is just temporary. If you're holding the course, stay to the course, brothers and sisters in Christ. If you've fallen flat on your face and you're starting to get into lust of the flesh, worldliness, you're starting to treat the brethren badly, you start getting prideful and puffed up, you start going the wrong direction, it's not too late to get back up to a standing position. My desire for you is to see all the brethren get in a standing position for us to have grace and peace among the body of Christ. To be of the same mind, the same judgment, striving together. Not just striving together for the gospel, but striving together for the living of the proper life as a Christian. To be there one for another. Why is the love of the brethren wax cold? Brethren are becoming fleshly and worldly. We're in the last days, the falling away. Iniquity is abounding among the body of Christ. We have a lot of lost people coming in. We're forgetting how we're supposed to correct one another. And we make everything confrontational and we forget how to correct one another. We forget that we're not supposed to be above taking correction. So I'm going to leave with that since it's been so long. We're not going to end with a hymn. I was going to read Psalms one, all of Psalms 141, but I'm going to leave that as homework, Brother Says Christ. Read Psalms 141. It's a good psalm on the, on the whole subject that we've been talking about here. Read Psalms 141. Okay. And I have a, song, a, a hymn here we were going to sing was this, Wherever He Leads, I'll Go. Wherever He Leads, I'll Go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so, wherever he leads I'll go. Brothers of Christ, we need to obey God first and do what's right by God first. And sometimes it's not easy correcting people. It's not always easy taking correction. Please read Psalms 141 and I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. And I'll see you in the next study.